You are listening to Voces Críticas, Critical Voices. I am your producer and host, Silvana Falcón. Today I'm speaking with Professor Alan Gomez. Professor Gomez is a historian, Southwest Borderlands scholar, and associate professor of justice and social inquiry in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. He's also an affiliated faculty member with the School of Transborder Studies and the Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts. Professor Gomez is the author of The Revolutionary Imaginations of Greater Mexico, Chicano-Chicana Radicalism, Solidarity Politics, and Latin American Social Movements, published in 2016 by the University of Texas Press. He is working on a second book manuscript, titled With Dignity Intact, Rebellion, Justice, and Power in the U.S. Federal Prison System, 1969 to 1974. This book is under contract with the University of Nebraska Press. Professor Gomez earned his Ph.D. in history from the University of Texas at Austin. I've invited him to the show to discuss his book, The Revolutionary Imaginations of Greater Mexico, along with his research more broadly. Welcome, Alan, to Voces Críticas. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. In your book, The Revolutionary Imaginations of Greater Mexico, Chicana, Chicano, Radicalism, Solidarity Politics, and Latin American Social Movements, you draw on years of interviews and archival research to uncover these cross-border connections between artists and activists throughout the Americas. Why do you think it's important for us to remember these historical relationships and connections today? Oftentimes, when we imagine what's possible in the present, we have our own references from the past that we draw from. Maybe Blackwell talks about the idea of retrofitted memory. And so I was very interested in artists and activists who were looking toward the Americas, Mexico, Latin America, uh, and had a another way of imagining what, how to organize society economically, politically, socially. And so given that we always continue to imagine and create and pay attention to what is emerging in the present, I wanted to sort of look back and research these particular political imaginaries that folks were using as inspirations to create their political projects. And can you explain your use of the term Greater Mexico in your title and in the work more generally? The term is from Américo Paredes, who's a folklorist anthropologist. The idea is sort of the larger cultural and political spaces that people of Mexican descent inhabited and lived in and moved around in. And even that, as we know, articulation or, or idea is complicated because the idea of Mexico and the indigenous Mexico and African Mexico in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, we see the sort of growing questioning of the assumption of identity in terms of these nation states, identity, Mexico, the United States. The idea, I think, has resonance today, given that so many reasons people are moving, are forced to move, choose to move, forced to make choices about moving for economic and political and social reasons. And the movement of people across the globe, which has always happened, People always bring with them culture, memories, references, imaginaries, and sort of ideas about how to make the world different, that world being family, community, friends. And so Greater Mexico was sort of to invoke sort of this imaginary of people that had been moving around from Mexico for generations and being inspired and participating in politics in Mexico, but understanding that that also impacted how they chose to engage politically, and particularly to the book I wrote in the 1970s, uh, politically in issues uh, around human rights, international support for socialist movements in other countries, police violence in the United States. And so that imaginary of the reference from which we dream something new, I wanted to draw from stories that were less told and less known. So one of the generative, I think, contributions your work makes is that we should be understanding the Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex movement within an international context. Talk a little bit more about why we should understand this incredible international genealogy. Well, it's curious in how writing about this book or these topics, theater, 
people who were supporting our movement in Mexico, feminist journalists and labor organizers in the United States, was that one, the border fundamentally kind of responding to your question is that what does that political border do to how we imagine where an imagination stops or where a politics stops? And I'm not only talking about sort of the phrase of the border crosses us, but this idea that oftentimes when thinking about what solidarity means, the other sort of main intervention of this book is that solidarity has always lived locally, always experienced locally. Even if it's international solidarity with a movement somewhere else, that representation of supporting somewhere else is always where one is at, or one organization is at, a group is at. In that sense, we can sort of think about just the longer historiography around borderland, and that in the 19th century, right, we had an internationalist imaginary in the sense of giving different meanings to what that border did and the meanings of its doing. In other words, the imaginary is about a different meaning of borders. All categories are a border, right? Even the very naming of an organization or an identity. But the idea was to invoke this imaginary of a shared solidarity that existed before the imposition of these political borders and existing through them. Very complicated, not an uncomplicated solidarity at all, but that it's something that we can think about that and other historians that I draw from have thought about that. How does that change us as individuals, the story that we tell about our own lives, but also how we imagine political solidarity, you know, in the present? So the question of international politics or, or international solidarity is always local, is always in the body as well. It's not just the social local, but the sort of how we live, the consequences of, of what we consume. I mean, there's politics to that, and this is what some of these folks were working on in the 1970s, you know, in terms of food politics. As Robin Kelly has offered, all new knowledge emerges from political struggle. Contradictions also emerge within political solidarity. Oftentimes people are hesitant, though, to call out the contradictions or to confront those contradictions. And I wondered what you think we lose politically and intellectually, when we don't actually willingly confront those contradictions when it comes to political solidarity based on these political histories that you uncover in your work? That's a big question. And the consequences of the answers are very important. How we sort of live with our own contradictions or how we write about the contradictions of who we are writing about, those two things relate. In terms of the questions that I'm asking or what I'm researching, you know, I was talking with Dr. Michelle Peyers recently about this. Those of us that experienced the 1990s and not only sort of the Zapatista movement, but even before that, what is it about those questions of neoliberalism and community organizing and grassroots and cultural production? And what is it about those questions that then we ask in the past? And so asking those questions around contradictions is or contestations or the politics of second chances or the politics of patience or how we create community accountability, those stories are still to be told, even though in, in what I presented, folks that I was able to interview and the questions that I asked, uh, that they were directly engaging some of the, you know, the violences with the movement, the, the machismo, the, the patriarchal violences, the anti-queer politics. But there are also the stories of the ways in which people came together to sort of figure something else out and not be able to. Those are challenging narratives to write about. And so what I wanted to try to do in this book was to both talk about these movements, artists, writers, and what they did and the meaning they gave to it, but also demonstrate that it was not romantic, it's not linear, it's complicated. And I think you know, the work that you've done in terms of the United Nations and, and looking at the, the Durban conference that happens in 2001 that's overshadowed by 9-11, and you tracing that sort of genealogy as well, I mean, that work, how do we recognize that the questions that we're asking about the past are deeply embedded in how perhaps we're trying to make something different in the present? There's a lot left out of this book. Anybody who's written the book has to make a decision. So the, the second book that I'm working on now that has to do with men in prisons in the 1970s in McNeil Island, Leavenworth, and Marion is looking at some of these questions around gender and care 
particularly with men, and how men were working out some of these contradictions amongst themselves. What does insurgent feminism tell you about courage? Insurgent feminists were really unapologetically fierce, and they were courageous. You specifically talk about Olga Talamante, who's a graduate from UC Santa Cruz. What does this kind of feminism reveal to you about the urgency of courage and being in your truth? Olga Talamante and and Magdalena Mora, the other that I write about, who passed away in 1981. And I mentioned that very specifically to bring back something that said earlier about how, you know, we live these violences in our bodies and in this particular way, we also struggle against them. And so the courage, particularly with Olga Talamante and Magdalena Mora, at that time, engaging in, as you're saying, pushing these contradictions, demonstrating them, being unapologetic about their politics, but also creating spaces to sort of figure out what to do as a result of it. And again, I think that anybody who maybe folks that are listening that are involved in something in some way knows that that's not simple, that's not easy, and we often don't write and talk about it. And so I think we think of Olga Palomas as you know, sort of trajectory. And, you know, she was fortunate enough to interview with me many years ago. Other folks have written about her as well. But her long arc of politics, political engagement, like Antonia Castaneda's as well, begins in the 1960s. And I mention Antonia as well because the different stories that we come to know about these folks, given the generation of scholars now that are asking different questions, means that we can have a response to what you're asking. So that when Olga Talamante, born in Gilroy, and for a number of reasons, traveling across Mexico, Central America, Argentina, and engaging with political movements in all of those different spaces, and bringing that analysis back to Santa Cruz, and bringing back a critique of U.S. imperialism, but also a critique of, you know, the language used at the time, machismo, but a patriarchal, you know, imaginary of the Chicano movement, but also an emerging queer politics. And I use that word emerging, hearkening to Agent Lou Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, that allows us to sort of see that courage is an ongoing process that has to do with the relationships that people are around us. So Magdalena Mora, as a labor organizer and CASA member, a writer, a feminist that was organizing in the Bay Area in Los Angeles, her courage, as we know, is based on who's around us, right? who inspires us. And I think those social relationships and those stories of how ideas circulate through people, through art, through failure, allows us to see that courage is a word that we have to use all these other words to explain what it means. We're left with the lives of the people in the struggles that are courageous. You're listening to Professor Alan Gomez, a historian, Southwest Borderlands scholar, and associate professor of justice and social inquiry in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. He is the author of The Revolutionary Imaginations of Greater Mexico, Chicana Chicano Radicalism, Solidarity Politics, and Latin American Social Movements, published in 2016 by the University of Texas Press. Now, Alan, as a researcher, I was struck at how you were able to manage, if you will, all of the multiracial and transnational coalitions you explore in your work. How did you as a researcher make these discoveries? As a historian, where did you start? I mean, I have to say it was just incredible to sort of read the multiple strands of movements and the way they all sort of came together in this mosaic in your book. Part of it was the political movements or projects that I was involved in in the 1990s and sort of who I came into contact with studied at the University of Texas, but I was also to graduate classes at the National University of Mexico. There was a series of questions that I was already asking. Basically, is where is the Chicanada in Mexico? If I trace it back maybe to 1992, there was a like an art exhibit in the Metro Valderas or Metro de Los Verdes, I forget which metro station, and it was like Arte Acá, and it was folks from Tepito that had, Tepito was a barrio just north of downtown Mexico City, that in the 1970s, with different mural artists, had connections in San Antonio and, and different parts of the Southwest. So I'd always sort of wondered about that sort of idea of, the, of Chicano, Chicano politics in Mexico. The Zapatista in 1994 and kind of the circulation of those ideas 
many of the people have the experiences of going to Chepos and, and sort of saying, okay, it's glad you're here, learn, but also go back to your communities and ask some of these questions as well. In Austin, Texas, there was a bookstore that was run by Raul Salinas, who I'm a poet, uh, activist, uh, human rights activist, member of the International Treaty Council. And that was a place that a lot of folks were oriented towards politically or because of literature or the arts. And so in those spaces, I heard these stories. We heard the stories about people, vans that were in Mexico in the 70s. And one of the stories was about a Salamante. Um, some of the other stories were the stories of Cleta, the organization in Mexico that emerges in the early 1970s, the result of the takeover of a university theater, and it becomes sort of a community-based cultural organization that exists to this day. And so it was the result of things that I was involved in and the relationships that I had. What I was able to do was a consequence of, obviously, scholars that came before me and I really want to mention two folks that I think are important for listeners if you're interested in these ideas is Cynthia Young's Soul Power and Laro Pulido's Black, Brown, Yellow, and Black. And that we're sort of asking some of these questions in the early and mid-90s, late 90s that when I was in grad school was very inspired by and then said, okay, what's around me? What are these historical questions? What's the moment now? And that being sort of the late 90s, early 2000s. And what is the relationship between a question that's asked in the present about the past. And this is not just about sort of academics and historians. I think all of us create a story that we imagine, rather, about where we came from, the history of our family, our own history, a nation-state, a community. And as we learn new things, that story changes. It might get less romantic. It might get more violent. It might not be recognizable anymore. For so many generations, people have been gathering in spaces to ask these questions, whatever they may be, to try to figure out how to change their everyday lives. Let's talk a little bit about your second book as a wrap-up. Your second book is called With Dignity Intact, Rebellion, Justice, and Power in the U.S. Federal Prison System, 1969 to 1974. Tell us a little bit about this book, and I know you want to talk also about the ethics bulwark that you're doing in the prison. So let's talk about those two things. There's a bit of a connection there. I'm writing about men in three different federal prisons, organizing, cultural work, political organizing, strike, human rights, research. That actually ends up being a very important campaign to challenge behavior modification and the control units in the federal prison system. And then the first book was supposed to be the, the one that's now going to come out. And then when some of these men released from prison, particularly Raul Salinas, Ramon Chacon, and Mario Cantu, that was going to be the sort of bridge to the book that we're talking about. So really what it is is an attempt to kind of bring together ethics studies and sort of what's been called incarceration studies, but the study of sort of, for me, prison rebellion, and something that I've just come to in the past couple of years or year and a half, sort of this question of bioethics or reproductive justice. And what I mean by come to it is that trying to ask questions about how men cared for each other in prison as they were struggling to survive during this time and how that's related to some of these larger historical questions around reproductive justice, the value of labor and bodies, but also the gendered nature of care. And so what I'm trying to ask are essentially, and I'm going to use sort of a, a term that I want to stop using, but I need to use it until I can figure out what to replace it with. But looking at the the bioethical question of incarceration, in other words, how it is that men were pushing back against the terms of humanity as defined by the state, by scientists, by academics, by journalists, by talking about a body politics and starting their political analysis against the state and demanding rights, demanding redress, demanding getting out of the hole, uh, demanding some things that we echo and hear in the Pelican Bay struggles in the past few years. So I'm really trying to kind of think about history and ethics studies, but also this bioethical question. Again, drawing from reproductive justice and the long trajectory and genealogy of black feminist research into how certain bodies and the violence against those bodies have created the possibilities of freedom and health and full lives for other people. And so in a book about prison rebellions, I'm trying to kind of look at some other questions that have emerged from the work that some of us have been doing 
more recently with Ethics Bowl, um, something that you're familiar with that you I know you were just part of the first faculty Ethics Bowl that ever happened. Yeah, that's right. The first faculty oh. Ethics Bowl. Ethics Bowl work I've been doing with a colleague at ASU, Dr. Jenny Bryan, at Perryville Prison was inspired actually of what Santa Cruz does at San Quentin. We had seen that and were inspired to sort of say, hey, let's try this here, which I want to say is sort of an example of the circulation of ideas, right, and kind of saying, well, how do we circulate ideas and kind of do something, take this from here and see what happens when we move it someplace else, not assuming that you can just cookie cut something. How long have you been doing the ethics bowl there in the prison? We started last November, and then we finished the first session, say, in March, and then we're waiting to start up again in the fall. And so, you know, we were, basically, we had kind of, you know, Dr. Brian and myself sort of had classes that were both looking at ethical theories, but more, you know, bringing in issues. One that was really uh, impactful was about the opioid crisis and who should be held responsible. Another one we talked about was felony voting rights. And so we would bring in materials to talk about different issues and then, you know, do the format that the Ethics Bowl does in terms of the going back and forth, trying to solve the problem rather than debate. Well, thanks, Alan, so much for taking the time to come on the show. I really enjoyed hearing more about your work and this new book. I can't wait for it to come out. Oh, thank you.